the University of Liverpool has rediscovered the concept, the applied concept of communities of practice. So it will be great if you could give us an overview of this concept, what are communities of practice and the relationship to social learning theory. A community of practice is, is basically a learning partnership, you know, among people who, who, who have a practice, who have something they want to learn how to do better, and they act as partners in figuring out how to, uh, how to do that better. So that's, that's really a si very simple idea. And in terms of how it relates to social learning theory, is that it's, it's an important unit of analysis for how the human world develops. It's almost like the, the cell that embody the learning of people. You know what I mean? Yes. And so communities of practice are everywhere. You know, they are not just among professionals. They are also among street gangs, among uh, people who do knitting and you know, all sorts of groups that are learning together how to do something that they care, uh, that, that they care about. So it's, a, it's an important foundational concept for a theory, from a social theory of learning that looks at society as both the product of learning and then how these communities as a product for learning becomes themselves a learning opportunity for newcomers. So, so you see what I mean? That yes. the community is the result of learning, but it enables learning by inviting newcomers. Right. So it's like a synergies, they're interconnected really. Oh yeah, I mean, they are, they are really about learning. Okay, about the learning of the community and the learning of new members who join, who join the community. This is great because um, I think sometimes it's very easy to get caught in this term community of practice, but I feel sometimes that it is misused. And th there is a quote from one of your interviews, which I really like. It is a community of practice is a bad way of getting people to do what they don't want to do. So can you explain the difference why something that is for the purposes of training or project work is not a community of practice and how can you differentiate and obviously best practice for creating a community of practice i think a lot has to, has to come down to your learning theory you see because a community of practice is 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 a different learning theory if you believe that learning happens when somebody who knows something passes it on to somebody who doesn't know it, and then learning happens, which is the basis for training, basis for a lot of um, professional development. Yeah. Then <clears throat> if that's what you're looking for, in other words, to transmit what's known to somebody who doesn't know, then that's not a community of practice. But if, you, uh, if your learning theory or if the appropriate learning theory for what you want to do is that you don't, nobody quite knows exactly what the answer is. And so by working it out together in a learning partnership, by exploring what happens in practice, does what works, what doesn't work, then, um, then a community of practice is, is what, is what, is what you what you need because it's good for things that are not yet known right because it's it's a committee of practice <clears throat> then pushing what's not yet known has to be built on practice you see what i mean <clears throat> to, yes so practice becomes the curriculum practice becomes the foundation for learning so practice and, being the foundation means it's not that you know what the you know what people ought to know, and so you build your curriculum around that. Your curriculum is what works and what doesn't work in practice, from the perspective of the practitioner. So the agency of the practitioner matters a lot because they 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 have to drive the practice from from their perspective. And if you use a community of practice to do something they don't want to do, yeah, chances are what they will learn is how to resist 
Of course, yes. yes. They will learn, they will, with each other, figure out how, because they don't want to do what you, what you ask them to, they'll, they'll figure out a way to get around it, to get okay. away with not doing what you want. Can you engineer the interactions or is it engineering interactions within a community of practice, is it valid? Or you just can engineer, come on, you have to interact with each other, do it. <laughs> you never, you can never force that. I mean, you can't, like with your friends, you may think two of your friends should be good friends, right? You can try and engineer their interactions and try and get them to have a good relationship. But it's, you, it's not going to work. I mean, you can set the conditions up for them to be able to talk to each other, set the conditions up that they sit next to each other when you arrange a dinner. Uh, you can set all sorts of conditions up, but you can't force them to do it. Even if you engineer wonderful questions within the space. No, it's great. You know, you can, like, like Bev was saying, you can, you, you can, you can put little place tags next to each other and they will feel forced to sit next to each other. You know and you I mean? may say, you may say, okay, guys, around our table today, as we have dinner, we're going to do a little, let's do a little game, all right? Let's go around and let's discuss, you know, where we want to be in 10 years' time. Because you think, oh, well, maybe they'd like to know that from each other. So you can do that. You can do what you like, but you can't, right. you can't force things to happen. You can't engineer things to happen. You can enable... You can create a container in which people can explore and discover each other as potential learning partners. You can do that. And the word engineering is tricky there. Okay. Because what yeah. Bev was describing is, it is kind of manipulating the world to increase the chance that something will happen. But if by engineering you mean you plan, and you have to <coughs> what happens, then no, you cannot engineer a community of practice. If by engineering you mean you plot. Yes. You know? Plotting. <laughs> That's a great word. You plot for these six people, these six champions, to kind of discover each other and find, wow, when we are together, some great things happen. And over time, over time, you might learn to do that better. You might learn that, oh, if you put them next to each other too early, then they resist each other. Or, you know, there are all sorts of things you may learn if you do it often enough. So maybe can you give me an example? Obviously, you have a lot of experience and you have you do consultancy about how to develop uh, communities of practice um, successfully. But have you ever encountered without naming names or people or companies or places you've been? a community of practice that was organized and didn't work out versus a naturally occurring one that kind of was successful organically? I mean, you have to be careful. There are organic ones that don't work out. Okay. And, and there are very structured ones that do work out. So it's not like either one or the other. I see. Okay. Okay. So you can really, you know, a lot of it is, do people see the value of being with the other people, you know, do they get value from it? Do they get value from talking to those people, having those interactions, feeling like, wow, I'm not alone. Do they get value by coming away with some good ideas that they can then use in, the, in practice? Do they get value by trying stuff out and having a community to come back and say, hey guys, I tried that out and it worked or it didn't work. Now, you can set that up or it can be organic. Uh, so it, it's more about value and f finding yeah, reasons for, va for value for people to be together. So you can have a, the, the problem, one problem that we see with people who try to structure community practice is they, they, for some reason, the, the, the question of value disappears. It's more like, what's a good question? How can we animate people to talk? How can we get people to interact with each other? Uh, oh, this is a topic that people want to discuss. Let's discuss it. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, that's a different, those are all, all very, those all might be important questions, but they are not a question of value. Right, is it? And actually, I have an example of, of what Bev is talking about. It was in a, in a, in a, in a big manufacturing company. Mm -hmm. There was a committee of practice of process engineers and they had been, so they, they, were a very, they were a successful community, they were, but then they were told by management, your community is now in charge of collecting data for quality control. Okay. Right? So all of a sudden, the community that, that people find value in, as Bev was saying, suddenly had to do a lot of work that they didn't find value in, right? And so the community was losing its energy, you know? Because it was a, a, a non, it was producing value for the, for the organization, but not for them. See? Of course, yes. And so, so that community was kind of dying because people were saying, I don't want to be part of it. I, I volunteered to be in that community because I was interested in talking to my colleagues. And all of a sudden, the fact that that volunteer has been, has been <laughs> hijacked by someone who wants to find a cheap way to do something for the organization. You know? I get this is a good point to be hijacked to be to, to do something for the organization. So I get a few complaints sometimes um, from people who are in context in which they develop um, they're trying to develop a community of practice. And I don't know if it's about mindset, but they say things like, uh, "Oh, I see, you want me to get do to, to do the job of someone else." So the responsibility falls on the shoulders of the community instead of the person responsible for it. And I feel it's like a, a mindset issue, but what would be your reply? What, what could I say to these people who say, okay, you're putting the responsibility of learning on me instead of putting on the management or the organization? I would want to know a little bit more about the context because I think you should also seriously ask yourself, are you doing that? Okay. No so me, they, but I've heard right, that. But, I mean, they may be right. They may yes. be right, and that may be the wrong, you know, it may be that it's not a community practice that is needed no. then. You don't need a community practice for everything. So no. they may be right. So you should have that yes. as, a, as a possibility. Okay. Yeah. yeah, because doing a job, doing an actual job is usually more the responsibility of a team than a community of practice. You know? Right. A team has a goal that it has to achieve, a budget. There is a team leader who is accountable for achieving the goal within budget and has authority about the member of the team. If they don't contribute, they are fired. Do you know what I mean? It's a very different kind of structure to accomplish a very specific thing within a specific constraint. Yes. The community of practice is really about learning, about you may not be a member of a team, where there are all those constraints, but in your community, you get ideas about how to do it better. You see? But so it's about value. Well, but also the community is not responsible for your job. No. You are responsible for your job and you suck stuff out of the community so you can do your job better. Yeah. But if you start blaming the community for someone's job, then you'll, ru you'll ruin the community because nobody wants to be responsible for somebody else's failure. Of course, yes. They are willing to help, you see. Willing, willing to help you when you have a struggle is different from accepting the blame if the struggle doesn't work out. You know oh, I, mean? I see, yeah, accountability, yes. Your last book, your, your latest book um, is about value creation and measuring this value. And, Personally, as a facilitator of a community of practice, I I find it a very useful resource. Would you like us? Um, would Would you like to talk about your book? I think there are really two parts of this book, and I don't know which one you want to you want us to talk about. Well, tell but us the the first part of the book, where we kind of recast the social learning theory mm -hmm. in terms of a concept that we call a social learning space which is very similar to a community of practice, but not quite exactly the same. And then the second part of the book, which is about how do we understand how these kind of social learning interactions, whether it's a social learning space or a community of practice, create value 
mm-hmm. for the members, for organizations, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, the, okay, the, the two are connected. Yes, but there is a, a lot of theoretical work that is being done to prepare for a book series that is going to take actually probably three books to finish. So it's it has doing the foundation work there. And then, then this value creation framework that we have developed uh, over, yeah, over 10 years or something. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Dave, would you like to say something about the book? I think that uh, one of the things that people seem to be finding most interesting about the idea of a social learning space, and it's related to the title of the book, which is the title of the book is Learning to Make a Difference. And so our emphasis really is on learning to make a difference and learning to make a difference. But the idea of a social learning space, which seems to be catching people, is this idea that in a social learning space, there are three things, three dimensions at work. One is the people in that space care to make a difference. The second is that in in caring to make a difference, they don't know what the answer is, right? So they uh, engage, we say, they engage uncertainty, right? So they are there without knowing. So the learning is driven by uncertainty, which is quite a novel idea because most people think of learning as driven by certainty, Hmm. what we know, okay? So it turns, things on its head and then engaging uncertainty makes you also pay attention so paying attention to what comes back to other people's experience to data to feedback and so it's it's a fairly simple on the surface idea that a social learning space which could be around the dinner table with your family or it could be a full-blown community of practice engaging in a social learning space, right? But this caring to make a difference, engaging uncertainty and paying attention um, is pretty important. And that's somehow a more lightweight entry, it appears, than the heavy lifting of a community of practice. Mm -hmm. A community of practice has to have continuity over time and a commitment to the shared practice, the social learning space has some of the characteristic of mutual engagement in learning that a community of practice has, but it may just be, as Bev was saying, just one conversation, or it may be that people actually don't share a practice at all. They are com- from completely different practice. You have, you have a nurse, a, a, a climatologist, and a paleontologist, and, but somehow they find an intersection where they can really learn from each other they never become a community of practice because they belong to different communities of practice, but they have an intense moment of social learning. So the, okay. the Great. reason we, we, we introduce that concept is to free people who would take, take to us, well, I'm not sure we are really doing a community of practice the way kind of apologetic. And no, that's no, okay, you have a social learning space and maybe it will become a community of practice over time and maybe not. Okay, fascinating that you could succinctly Summarize 10 years of work. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, I've still read your book and there is a lot of depth to that, but thank you. Um, um, Beb, you mentioned a keyword, I think is uncertainty and people feel very uncomfortable with uncertainty. You feel vulnerable and in a, in a social learning space or a community of practice, you don't want to seem as you, you don't know what you're doing. And I think this is one of the beautiful things about communities of practice that you show up and you are vulnerable but to me they're also about uh, unity in the face of uh, uncertainty and I feel I personally feel um, that unity is very much needed um, in any organization within the employees Um, what are your thoughts and you talked about on uh, the social the people which are key this is key for social learning Um, what are your thoughts on the human side and from the roles of the facilitator to the leadership, to the periphery participation of the members? Um, do we 
need a leadership team, team within a community of practice or can we just do with the facilitator and the members? I would like your, from years of experience, your thoughts on the people side of communities of practice. Well, you, you've asked a lot of things actually in, in those sentences. Okay. Sorry. So, uh, <laughs> that's all right. I'm going to go with the last one because I've got okay. a rather short okay. memory. <laughs> so um, the, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you asked if you need a leadership team or a facilitator's okay. I mean, in a community of practice, there is there are a lot of what we call leadership tasks that need doing. Mm -hmm. right? And I mean, that includes, for example, paying attention to the learning agenda. What is it that people are struggling with? What do we need to, you know, what kind of conversations do we need to have in order to make progress on those sort of challenges? It, it, it also requires thinking about the social fabric of the group, who's talking to who, where are the power politics happening, whose voice is being heard, whose isn't, how, another thing we have to think about, are we creating a shared memory here? If we're not talking about, you know, stuff in books that gets passed on, we don't have a book, we're creating knowledge on the go. So we need to be creating a shared memory of what it is that we're doing. We need to be thinking, if we're gonna survive as a community, we've gotta be providing value to the organization or to outside, how are we communicating with them? Mm -hmm. right? So there's a, there are a whole bunch of different things, leadership tasks that need doing in a community of practice. Now you could say, okay, that's fine. We get a facilitator, they'll do it all. That's fine. But apart from the fact your facilitator might have a breakdown after a year, um, <laughs> you might want to have um, a team of people and ideally a team of members yes to okay. do to share in those tasks so to distribute the leadership across the group and when we work with groups actually we always assign everybody to a task so we say you 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 and you will take care of the learning agenda. You, 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 and you will take care of the social fabric. You, 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 so that everybody has a task. I mean, people can volunteer for it. There are different ways to get people to do it, but you can distribute the task across the members. Now, whether that's a leadership team or a facilitator, it still needs a facilitator to help people take on the roles and to put time in the agenda for them. But uh, that's, that's, yeah. So, so it's, it works better as a distributed leadership yes. approach mm -hmm. instead of the, the kind of post-heroic one hero that saves the day. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially over time. Sometimes at the beginning you need this one hero because nobody else is ready yeah. to, do, to take on the task that Bev is, is, is describing. But over time, if a community constantly depend on, on that single heroic person, I think that's a that's a disease of, a, of the community. Yeah. It's a oh, of, interesting. It's a, it's, a, it's a lack of maturing. As a community matures, you, you would like other people to say, wow, this is really valuable. I, I, I want to help make it happen. OK. But I want to go back to something you said in the beginning. Yes. You know, that you, you were almost like putting in contrast the engaging uncertainty and the kind of commitment to each other. Right. Right. But to us, that's where they happen. You see what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so recognizing you need in a social learning space or in a community of practice for that matter, you need people to see the value of that uncertainty because they are struggling with it too. Right. And so it may be like you were talking about engineering. Yeah. It may be you need a bit of engineering. Like you may suggest to someone who is a really respected practitioner to bring a problem, you know, to bring a problem to the table and break the ice by saying, well, if that person, she's so good, so respected, if she can bring a problem, I can bring my problem too. See what I mean? So okay. you, you, you create this atmosphere where, like Bev was saying, where, where, where engaging uncertainty becomes a form of leadership, you know? 
I see. Yeah. That's a great tip. I think people will love that. You mm -hmm. invite a big person who shows up and is vulnerable, don't know what to do, please help. That's a fantastic strategy. Thank you. <laughs> and also, I but just wanted to say that, um, that if your community of practice, if the members in your community of practice are only dealing with stuff where the answer is known, then it may be, you know, they're not pushing themselves hard enough. In a way, that's what happened. You see, what happened with COVID is that suddenly something was dropped in and nobody knew what to do. Nobody knew how to do it. Yes. So, it, you know, it, look how it brought people together to say, oh, oh my God, what are you doing? How do we deal with this? So that was one extreme. But really, in the world that we live in, we don't know how to do a lot of things. And all those times where we think we know what we're doing, actually, the rug keeps being pulled from under our feet. And so, you know, if you're not dealing with things where people are uncertain, then maybe those, you know, maybe those aren't the right things, you know. And maybe the difference they're trying to make is not high enough, you see what I mean? Because of course, it's like, if, if you are uh, among nurses, you know, and somebody says, I'm not sure, I'm not so sure about the color of blood. I'm okay. A bad, a bad example. <laughs> yeah. there, there will be shame. Like, what do you mean? You have never seen blood, you know? Yeah. So, so if, when we, if we're talking about, as Bear was saying, things that everybody knows, then it's, it's embarrassing not to know. Mm. But if the difference people want to make is hard enough, that for everybody is like, I, I don't really know how to do that. Then it becomes much more natural among the group to engage, to engage in uncertainty because people will know that, yeah, yeah nobody, nobody knows how to do that. I think if we try to figure out together, we'll be better off than if we try to figure out on our own. Of course, you always get the odd person who knows everything. Um, so, uh, you know, the problem is that a little bit of uncertainty, I mean, my grandson is one, you know, <laughs> but you, uh, so you have to set up the condition, you, you have to be ready as a facilitator to be able to get people to hold back. We don't have to find the answer straight away. We don't have to know. You don't have to belong to the space. You, you know, knowing isn't a reason for belonging to the space. Yeah. This is very interesting because um, I read more and more visionaries, um, not necessarily academics or recognized academics, but um, they claim that higher education has had its time in that it's all about taking agency because Beb, you mentioned that things change so fast and what you know today might change tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So you have to take ownership of your personal learning, your transformation and growth. Mm -hmm. How do you envision? I think communities of practice are, is a great way of supporting this, but I want to hear your thoughts. How communities of practice are going, what's the role they're going to play in this, maybe in 20 years, I don't know, 30 years? I'm not saying higher education will die, but things change so fast. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one thing that we are often saying, or I mean, where we think it's going is, Really, the role of the higher education is a convener, a systems convener, mm. convening groups of people around an issue or a challenge that needs to be resolved in the landscape in which the university is located. So they need to know the landscape and they need to know what are the issues and how are we in a dynamic way you know, how are we going to be able to bring people together to make progress on these issues? And that's, you know, they are no longer universities. Yes, it's not enough to have like a big library and a big stack of knowledge and get your credibility and your legitimacy from that. You'll get your legitimacy as a higher education institution because you know the landscape and can bring people bring different perspectives, uh, different knowledge bases, different expertise, different experience from across the landscape. 
Fantastic. Thank and you. That's where I, I think I think your notion of agency really matters, because if the purpose of education is to take a curriculum that's already known and defined and to transfer it into somebody's head, then agency doesn't matter. You know, as long as they pass the test, it means that curriculum has made it into that head. Education's done. Graduate. That's why we, we, we entitle our book, Learning to Make a Difference. Because learning to make a difference means you want to do something. You want to have agency. And so I think that it's going to be really important for, for institution of higher ed, but even schools, actually, even yes. schools, mm -hmm. uh, 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 primary and secondary schools, to start thinking, OK, it is true that there are certain elements of curriculum that have to make it into a person's head. But there's only a small part, a very small part of education. A lot of education is how can I make a difference in the world, in myself, in my context, in my family, in my community? Yeah. How do I become, how do I work an agent? And then, oh, as an agent, I need that skill. You know? Yeah. Okay, I need that skill, I need that knowledge, I need that library that Bev was mentioning. But it's driven by agency, it's not driven by curriculum. And that's, to us, the big shift that has to happen. Okay, great. So this, very interesting. Uh, what, 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 what are your thoughts on artificial intelligence and communities of practice? Do you think machines are going to conquer the fast exchange of knowledge in what people are capable of doing when they come together? I would like to hear your opinion on artificial intelligence and the influence on communities of practice. I can see Etienne smiling about it. <laughs> Well, PhD you know, I, was in artificial yes, intelligence. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so I don't know. The truth, the truth is I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think that big data and artificial intelligence are going to bring about a lot of changes. Yeah. But the day that we assign agency to these systems is not, is not very near and, and what that would look like is very difficult to know. You see? Mm -hmm. Because meaning making is really important. And the identity is a, a very central uh, pillar of making meaning making. And for machines to make meaning by creating an identity that has social currency, mm -hmm. that, that is gonna take a while. Okay. It's the nuances of being human, I guess. I don't know, that's the way I see it. You can't replicate that in machine. My opinion, I don't know. We I don't, don't know. know. We, we don't wanna predict. Yeah. But, but, but machines can do a lot without, without getting there. You see what I mean? They can, they can recognize patterns, for instance, in ways that human beings are not equipped to. So this is very useful, you know? So we, we don't want to we predict. Don't. What we are saying is that it's a learning journey, you know? Because, you know, having a hammer or ha having a stone to cut, to cut your coconut transformed. Yes. Humankind, you know, so all the tools transform humankind, you know, now we have the internet, just the internet, just the fact that we can have this interview while you're sitting in London and we're sitting in Portugal, you know, and that, that is incredible. That is a big change. It is. You know, so I think, I think technology is going to continue bringing about this big change. And I think human beings are also going to change. They're also going to learn how to be who they are and how to, to find meaning, you know? So to think machines are gonna take over, what does it mean? They're gonna, they're gonna become part of, of how we make meaning of the world. But that's, that's been going on for, for centuries, you know? It's accelerating now, but, but that's why, like Bev was saying, we live in a time when there's a lot of uncertainty and we need to engage with that uncertainty in meaningful ways, in way, ways that call upon our agency and call upon 
our meaning making capabilities and the strength of social ties that allows us to do that. Okay, thank you. Powerful, yes, definitely, I agree. <laughs> and the truth is we don't know, you're right. Um, okay, I guess this is our last question, I think. Um, how can, so I'm, I'm a big fan of always showing students the way, because like we, we talked about the curriculum and it's about transferring the knowledge and then you graduate and off you go. But I feel being able to create an effective community is a skill that students should have. Uh, everybody, right, that is interested and passionate about something, perhaps, perhaps not everybody is interested in doing that, playing that role, but how can we as educators help students access and develop knowledge ability, but also um, become creators of spaces for knowledge exchange, whether a social learning space or a community of practice? How can we support them in this? Do you know something? I was, I'm thinking of this school that I visited in Hong Kong, not in Hong Kong, in Singapore, mm -hmm. where the students, uh, the students came, they just had to have a device, iPad or a computer, I mean, otherwise, anyway, they had a, a device. They didn't have lessons. Right? They had to create their own problems they discuss what problems they wanted to solve in the classroom with their teacher mm -hmm. but the teacher was a facilitator and what the teacher taught them was how to create safe critically aware networks and communities online in order for them to be able to find the best possible information and um, so it was it was interesting. So in order for them to solve their problem, they'd be, they were very keen on, yeah, making sure that they had a good uh, network or sometimes it became a community who would be able to help them to solve their problems, which would help them do their homework <laughs> and help them pass their tests. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I was just thinking yeah, of that, that it's a very concrete way that some people are really actually doing it. Yeah. And these were kids of 12, 13, 14. So just show them the way, probably. Yeah, showing them the way, uh, uh, because saying that if you want to be resolving problems or finding out how to do stuff, you need to be able to use the internet, but you need to be able to use it wisely. You need to be critical. You need in, you know, literacies. You need to be uh, have information literacies. Um, but you and you need to know how to create a network of people around the world. So these guys, these guys were hugely networked. These little fourteen-year-olds with other people who were working on similar things, or adults who were solving problems. Um, yeah, I believe Singapore has one of the best education systems in the world. Am I wrong? I think. They I think they do. I think they do pretty well. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At least. They're, and they're very experimental. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Experiments are important. At the end, do you have something to add to that? Well, yeah. yeah. I, I think that 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 what what Bev is right is that is that when students are driven, then they reach out and they form learning partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and 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 we call this learning citizenship. That. You, 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 to use your term, you engineer, <laughs> yeah. right? The kind of communities you need or you join. You see, one, one skill is, is, is leading a, com a community, but also joining a community meaningfully. How do you participate in a driven community meaningfully? How do you engage in this kind of mutual quest? You know, I mean, the problem, the problem now is that without in critical information literacies, the problem is that kids can join and reach out communities that are not necessarily very helpful. Fake news. Uh, or healthy. <laughs> yes, or healthy. Fake yeah. news or, you know, and, and while, 
yeah, while things, other bigger issues like identity, you know, identity and agency is often left aside in schools. And so kids may use communities to find that. So for example, you know, you can find radical, um, radical people who will help you create an identity, a very simple identity, believe this, wear this, pray here, um, and, you know, and, and you have this identity. So, you know, the, it have to be careful that kids are not escaping from a world which doesn't, where, where they don't feel like they have an identity and they find a community in which they I can see. have one. Yes. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Okay, so that was my last question, but before you go, and because the open source course I'm developing is called Developing Communities of Practice, I would like your top three tips for people to develop their own communities of practice. Just three, from your wide range of knowledge, I'm gonna narrow it down to three tips, each of you, please. Three each? Okay. Well, it's well, up to you. So <laughs> yeah, we, we can do we can do three each. We do well, we take it in turns, Etienne. I'll do okay. the first one. So of course, well, the first one is finding something that people care about. Mm -hmm. So if you want to develop one, you've got to go out, sense, ask, talk. What do people really care about here? Not what topic do you want to discuss, but what do you care about? Where do you want what what would be different in the world if you know? And who do you need to talk to in order to start doing that? So in developing community of practice, a lot of talking to find out answers to those questions. Okay. And I would, I would build on that by saying, you better care about it too, you know? Yes. So the invitation into a community of practice is, I care about that. Don't you care about that too? And we can care about it together. So, okay. And number three, who's got number a three, number three. Um, so as you're talking to people to pay attention to who are those who care about it so much that they will go the extra mile with you to make this happen. So find yourself your own, find yourself a team of people to help you or people find out who are the people who will help to do what? And not everybody will help everything, but locate the places where you can get help. Okay, fantastic. Etienne, you have a final final. Well, I, I was gonna say, and building on that, yes. then bring people together around their uncertainty, around what they struggle with. So one danger of a committee of practice when you start is what Bev was saying, the list of topics. Okay, so we have a list of topics and over the year, every month we'll take, one, we'll take up one, you know, that, that does not going to give that sharpness of a committee of practice. It's, it's going to be like a brown bag lunch meeting, right? Mm -hmm. We invite a speaker on this topic, we invite a speaker on that topic. It's not going to have that kind of like intensity. There's an intensity in a well-working committee of practice that people really need each other to make the difference they want to make. And so when you bring people together in the early days, have them talk to each other on what they struggle with, not the topics they'd like to learn. Right. And, and have the, the bonding in the community come around, okay, these are the struggles that we all have. If we could make progress towards these struggles, we would find a lot of value in being together. 